Well, it is a new year, fresh starts, uh, time for new rhythms. I don't know if you've changed anything in your life. I did my obligatory annual sign up for a gym membership yesterday. Uh, <laughs> hopefully it'll lead to something we shall see to be determined. Um, changing some physical rhythms. I'm, I'm adjusting my curling schedule. I'm trying to change some social rhythms. I looked uh, around and I was like, man, there's some people that are really important to me that I haven't spoken to in a really long time. So I, I reached out to them and I get to lunch with one of them after church today, which is great. Um, and then I've also taken some steps to try and do some new spiritual rhythms that will hopefully um, grow me closer to the Lord than I've been. Um, I'm reminded that the spiritual life, it, it feels like um, an iceberg to me, which if you've ever seen a picture of a whole iceberg, it's not just the part on top, like a good chunk of that thing is, is underwater. And a lot of what happens in our relationship with God happens below the surface when nobody's looking. Um, and so uh, what would it look like for this year to expand our, um, our base of our spiritual life? And to that end, um, I'm gonna start a new series and it's gonna be on prayer. Because I think prayer is, is right at the heart of what it means to, to grow in our faith, to have a relationship with God. And it's also one of these areas that um, we don't watch each other and how we pray very often. And yet it makes such a huge difference um, to our lives. So um, to that end, I want to, I, I skipped the, the Lord's Prayer earlier. I don't know if it's possible to bring that back up. It'll probably involve going through some slides. But um, I'd like to pray now, because that's what we're going to start at looking at for this series on prayers. We're going to look at the Lord's Prayer and, um, and look at what it has to say about God and it has to say about us and our relationship with God. So let's pray this together. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Awesome. Um, that prayer was given to the disciples uh, in two different places. One is on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and it says that Jesus, after ministering to the crowds, went up on a hillside with some of his disciples. And one of the things that he taught them is how to pray. And that's, that's found in Matthew 6, uh, those words we just prayed. The other place that it's brought up is in Luke chapter 11. And uh, his disciples come to him and they ask a question that they would have asked of any rabbi, which is, um, could you teach us what it means to pray? And, and most rabbis would have had a prayer that, uh, that their disciples would recite. And it would... Um, teach them how to pray and have the relationship with God that they had. And, and it sort of served two folds. One was that it, it, memor it could be memorized. Um, but the other thing was that it sort of laid out like an outline. What, what sort of things should be involved in prayer? And this is what, what Jesus gave. And it's, it's a rather striking prayer. It, it talks to God differently than people had talked to God before. Um, prayer is really that. It's just talking with God. And it tells a lot about our relationship with how we talk to somebody. Um, and this is in any area. Um, how I talk to a stranger, like let's say I go get a coffee, the barista, I've never seen them there before. How I talk to them is going to be different than how I talk to a friend. It would be weird if I said, hey, what's your name? Um, do you want to sit down and we can, we can have a talk about how you're doing and I can share how I'm doing with you? They, that, would, that would be very odd. Um, how we talk to a boss or a teacher is different than how we would talk to a peer um, or a friend. I assume in, in Karen Stone's classroom, they don't uh, address her like they address their buddies on the playground. I think that would be weird. Um, you wouldn't talk to your boss like you would your little brother or sister, harass them, give them a hard time. I can be, uh, I'm learning sarcasm from Christina. I'm getting better at it. It's not, it's not my native tongue. But I'm learning it. But, but with friends, you can give them a hard time. I mean, I get together with guys and I have coffee and, and we, we give each other a hard time. It would be really weird to talk to somebody in authority like that. I probably wouldn't do that with the policeman who pulled me over for speeding or something. <laughs> would not be the right time. Um, there's, there's something about the way we talk to somebody that describes the relationship. 
Um, I was down uh, in Las Vegas visiting my brother once, and uh, my brother's an interesting cat. He goes to church a couple times a year, um, would view himself as a Christian, uh, but I wouldn't say it's, it's an incredibly active part of his life. And I went down there, and um, because he had a pastor at the table, I think, he said, why don't we pray before this meal? I don't know if they do this on a regular basis. He said, why don't we pray before this meal? So, so uh, Buzz, which is what my family calls me, could you, could you lead us in a, a prayer before the meal? And I said, sure, no problem. God, thanks so much for the trip. Thank you for this incredible food that's here, and that I get to spend some time with my brother. You, you've really done a great job. Uh, taking care of us so far, and, and man, we just love you. Thank you so much, God. And I finished, right? And I, I lifted up my head, and my brother goes, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. You talk to him like he's like right here in your friend. I really hope you don't pray in front of your church like that. Um, I said, actually, I do. Um, he said, well, that doesn't seem reverent at all. And it reminded me that um, there is something about the way that we talk about God that affects our relationship. And my brother's relationship with God is a very different one than the one that I have. Um, another time that that prayer really took on this sort of framework of a relationship was uh, when I was in Bible school, I, um, I had a breakup that just, I, I was a mess. Um, I got to the point where I was ready to say to this girl, I love you. It's just a big step in college relationships. It was, it was just a huge deal. At the exact same time, she got to the point where she was like, I don't think I really want to date Chris anymore. Uh, a really awkward timing there. And um, at the time, I was studying the Book of Lamentations, which is uh, <laughs> Jeremiah letting loose on God for something much more significant, how the city of Jerusalem has fallen and all the horrible atrocities that were happening in the midst of this wartime to the city uh, that was just getting crushed. And, um, and my professor at the time pointed out that Jeremiah is a prophet, and here he is just letting God have it for how mad he is. And that's pretty much the point of the whole book. Like, that's what you get out of the book of Lamentations. And... Uh, <laughs> And his point was that God can handle that. So at the same time as all this was going on, I went out to a field at our school, and I just tore into God for the very first time in my life. Before that, I had always been very proper. I, I had good theology. I wasn't going to say anything that might offend God. And my prayer life was made to be seen by others so that they could hear that I was a good prayer. Um, but I was not in that state at that point. Um, so I let God have it, and when I finished praying, and I opened up my eyes, right in front of me was an entire family of deer, like 10 feet away, which was kind of crazy. But what was uh, even more crazy was in that one moment, I knew that God was still with me, that he still cared, and that this did not disrupt him in the least. And he was a loving father who could take me being mad at him. And it opened up this whole idea of being able to just be honest and real with God. Now, in the sermon that we just, or the, the prayer that we just prayed, Jesus begins with the words, Our Father. And you may have heard this before, but uh, it's the word Abba. It, it literally translates into like a family word. I don't know what you called your dad growing up. Did you call him Pops? Or, or uh, Dad? I called my dad Dad. Or daddy or whatever you called your dad that was sort of the term it was like just an affectionate family term like hey dad it's time for dinner that was sort of like the abba um, and that was not how people prayed to god before they would say um, the traditional way a hebrew prayer would start with is is baruch atha adonai elohim which means blessed are Melech Ha'olam, which means king of the universe. Big, 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 like God is the Lord, our God, the king of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth. These are typical things that were in prayer. And um, an Old Testament scholar, um, Jehoiakim, did research on all the prayers in the Old Testament, as well as all the prayers that the rabbis had written about the Old Testament. And what they found was not a single one 
ever started with the term death. No one had ever prayed our Father before. Yet Jesus, in almost every prayer that he prays, says, Dad. The very first um, thing that we know of Jesus really saying happened at the age of 12. He gets separated from his family. They're in Jerusalem. And uh, imagine being lost in a mall, except much, much bigger. <laughs> Parents look all over the city. They can't find their kid. They eventually go to the sanctuary where they see Jesus saying really profound things and teaching people at the age of 12. And they go, we have looked all over for you. How could you do this to us? And he responds, why did you look all over? Didn't you know I was going to be in my daddy's house? With my father. That's how Jesus viewed God. And, and the significance of what Jesus did in this is he took his sonship, his unique being a child of God in the family, not having a God who is a part of your kingdom, the one on the throne, the one we are subject to, the one that we're lucky to be a part of this kingdom. Instead, he takes his unique sonship and he says, you know what, when you pray, this is who your God is. He's your dad. He's close. It was a shocking idea at the time. Um, Imagine if you got ushered into a mighty throne room. There is some certain hopes there. You would maybe get a chance to say something. Um, you know your well-being is in this mighty throne's uh, hands. It'd almost be like getting to visit the White House and, and, and be able to talk to somebody in power and be able to say, you know what, we really need to do something about the poor. That's what I came to say. And then you would nod and sort of back away, but there would be a certain semblance of, of respect and fear. Um, and what Jesus did in this moment was to say, would you talk to your dad like that? Would you talk to a loving father like that? Um, I don't want to mischaracterize the, the Catholic faith at all, because um, I've known some really beautiful Jesus-loving Catholic folks. Um, but there was something about folks that I know who were brought up Catholic where they go, I feel the respect that one should feel towards God. Um, I know what it is to have that respect and that fear that we often might lose. Um, but there's also a, a, a level of guilt and fear and distance that's there that doesn't line up with this prayer. God is much, much closer than we give him credit for. And we need it much, much more, too. A father is one who provides. Um, without the father of the family, the family was in deep, deep trouble in Jesus' era. Um, and I don't think we do that very well in this culture. We are taught to take care of ourselves, to have it together. Um, and, and we sort of do that with God. We have this idea that um, God is expecting us to take care of our own life until we hit something where we can't. And that's when people start praying in a totally different way. They go, oh my goodness, cancer. I don't know how to fix that. And suddenly prayer becomes really, really important. Or you lose a job and you have no clue how your hands are going to be. Then all of a sudden prayer becomes incredibly important. Um, and that doesn't really fit this picture of a God who's close in a family. Last week I... Uh, shared 1 John 4.16 uh, as kind of a verse that was going to shape my year. And it says that we are called to know and rely on the love of God for us. Without God's love, without Him sustaining us, without His care, without His protection, we are lost. We need a God who's close and is a Father and takes care of us. The other thing that we do, especially when life gets a little tricky, is we start to wonder about God's motives. I remember uh, at different times when ministry has been hard, thinking maybe God is toying with me. Maybe he's up there like having a great joke and calling the angels in to go, look, we're going to put him to the test. Oh, look at him flounder around. And, and that doesn't really make sense because um, if we do take this idea of an adoptive parent taking somebody in as their own family, um, that'd be a 
really, really not very loving adoptive parent who adopts their kid just to toy with. You don't adopt somebody uh, for personal gain or enjoyment. Um, I was looking at the cost of adopting a kid, raising them. Uh, wow, get ready for this commitment. The cost, the average cost of raising a child right now, whew, it is $304,000. Not something to do for gain, for personal uh, financial gain for sure. Um, and it cost God even more to adopt us into his family. It cost him his life. That's how much he loves us. Um, and he doesn't expect us to do life on our own either. Uh, imagine somebody adopting a kid and they're doing the interview where they go, well, would you be a good parent? Uh, and then the parent says, well, you know, I will adopt this child as long as he prepares his own meals, uh, as long as he buys his own groceries, saves up for his own uh, college and um, we'll do his own laundry. Uh, and while you're at it, uh, he's got to pay me rent because this room is not for free. I mean, so this is what we're going to expect of this little adopted child that as he grows, he should be able to do these things right off the bat. Because I, I don't want to have to go through needing to take care of him. That would make any sense. God wants to be involved in our lives. Think of a parent with a kid who has an ear infection. They're probably not going to die of the ear infection. But a loving parent, they just feel bad for the kid. They want their kid to be better. They would do anything for them. Uh, have you ever been to a first grade graduation? I didn't have those growing up, by the way. Did you have those? I didn't have graduations until at least like high school. I'm pretty sure. I don't even think we did middle school graduation. Apparently, there's a graduation for everything now. But. <laughs> First grade graduations, there are parents who are like leaping into the aisle with their video camera to catch this moment. And the kid, I'm not even sure if he's excited or proud. He just knows he's supposed to dress up in this goofy clothes and like walk across and get the, I don't know. But parents are stoked for these moments. You ever go to a recital? There can be some bad music at children's recitals. They can be rough. But if you ever look at the parent of the kid who's having the rough time, they are waiting on the edge of their seat, and they are so excited to hear Mary had a little lamb in all of its glory performed. <laughs> what if God was actually there, concerned about what was going on in our lives, and wanting to celebrate all the little victories, walk us through all the challenges, and be there for us and see us thrive? Because that's what we hear at the cross, is God saying, I love you so much, I would do anything to see you thrive. What we see in Jesus' prayer is, I want to be close with you. I want to be a part of every area of your life. I have run across a ton of analogies um, as a Christian of who God is, and um, a lot of them were trying to share the gospel and, and referred to God as maybe a judge up there. Like, But because of Jesus, we don't get the sentence we deserve. We're forgiven. We're, we're set free. But judges don't care deeply for the person behind the um, desk there who they could uh, give a punishment to. Or, or the debtor. I mean, this is right out of Scripture. Jesus says, imagine that you owe somebody a million dollars. And then they turn to you and they say, you know what? I know you can't pay. I'll forgive your debts. Um, that's a transaction. That's not a loving father either. Or that horrible story of the train crash. Do you know the story of the train crash? There's a, there's a train and it's screaming towards somebody who's stuck on the tracks. But thankfully the son hops off the train, runs ahead, gets the person out of the way, but in the process gets hit by the train. And that's what salvation's like. I'm like, God's a train operator about to hit me? <laughs> this is so confusing. Or even the exercise of faith, he's like a chair. You put your weight down on him, and only once you put your weight down on him do you realize that he's there for you. And I'm like, I sit on God? <laughs> or a bridge that we cross over the sin as and we can't get past, and, and God is there. <laughs> <in this chair. laughs> Anything short of a loving parent doesn't do God justice. It might make the point, but it doesn't do God justice to what he says. He's like. I want to share with you Ephesians uh, 1, 3 through 7. And um, I'm 
so excited. I got to share one of my Christmas presents with you. Um, one of the elders of the church, our, our dear friend Will, got me these. The Full Armor of God Magnetic Bookmarks. <laughs> How much time at Harbor has been wasted while Pastor Chris is trying to find a verse in a Bible? No longer, friends. No longer. Will is watching out for all of us. Oh, it was Alyssa? Well done, Alyssa. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Maybe they're just pointing at each other. Anyways, I'm really excited. This is going to work out. So let me read the scripture for us. Um, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us, like an adoptive parent, in him, before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love, he predestined us for an adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one that he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us. God loves us way more than we can ever give him credit for. There is a difficulty with this thing of calling God Daddy, though. It came up in seminary, we were talking about it, and we honestly had this debate, and this is how foolish you are in seminary. We had this debate about how it raises dad issues for people. Because when you start saying God's like dad, and dad wasn't so great, then you end up in this spot where you go, man, really? Ooh. I don't know if I want to know this God you're talking about. Um, and we talked about how maybe we shouldn't use the term father anymore when talking about God. We needed to replace it. As if we needed to come along and follow Jesus up and us seminarians could tell Jesus what was how we should pray. That we're going to just change a few things. Um, and that's where the second phrase gets so important of that line. Our Father who is in heaven. Heaven is perfect. Our dads were not perfect. Um, they are not the same. Sometimes when dad wasn't perfect, that picture gets more foreign. We don't know what life's like in heaven. We can imagine what it's like. We can imagine how things should be and how they could be. And that's who God is, the God who should and could be better than we could imagine. Um, but if we just take what we think of as dad and put it on God, it doesn't always work. Um, I had a great dad, by the way. Pretty good dad. Um, but I still remember when I was 15, my dad was restoring this Carmen Ghia, Volkswagen, nice little car. It was burgundy, it was gorgeous. And he said, when you turn 16, this car is yours. Pretty sweet. He thought he could use it to help teach me how to fix cars, and I never was into it. He's like, hand me that tool. And I'm like, I don't know which tool it means. Um, and I goes gazing off. Um, I was never a big car repair guy, but um, but this Carmen Ghia was cool, and I could picture like driving that into school, and the people flocking around me to see my new car, and how popular I was going to be with this. And then uh, that's probably a little bit of my own imagination. But then we had this garage sale, and this guy rolled up and was like, "That's a nice Carmen Ghia. Can I buy that?" And my dad was like, "How much do you want to buy it for?" And the guy made him a great offer, and so my dad took it. I was so mad. By the way, funny um, things that get passed down. I found out that my dad's dad had done the same thing to him. So it's pretty <laughs> interesting. Um, but man, I held that against my dad for so long. And so what I can take from that is that dads make promises that they don't keep. It'd be weird for me to say that God makes promises he doesn't keep because my dad sold the Carmen <laughs> It doesn't make sense a little bit. Um, he was a great man, my dad, um, but he wasn't a perfect man. And he wasn't my father in heaven. You know, Jesus, um, we don't know much about Joseph. We know he was a pretty faithful guy uh, at the time of the pregnancy. Um, we know he went looking for him after he got lost in Jerusalem. Uh, that is about all we know. Once he turns, Jesus turns 30 and ministry starts, Joseph is nowhere to be found. It's mysterious.
mysterious. He's just gone. And there is um, a lot of people who think that he probably had passed away. He either passed away or got taken or left. But my guess is that was hard on Jesus at some point in his life to lose a dad. Um, he was not immune from that, so he probably had some earthly father issues. But that didn't change his view of his heavenly father. There is a great comfort that I have found in having a heavenly father, and that's that he fills in the gaps that we have for love. Because he is enough, and he is perfect. So what do we do with this heavenly father who adopts us? How do we live that out? I think the first thing that we can take from it is that God is a lot closer than we give him credit for. And we can quit living on our own with a distant king. That's not the paradigm. Instead, um, we don't have to walk into a throne room. We walk into a living room, and Dad immediately says, how is your day? What's going on? Let's chat. That's what prayer can be. The other thing is that when, when a kid gets adopted, and then he, he does some things well, parents celebrate, but then when the kid rebels and has a hard time, do the adoptive parents go, all right, well, we adopted you, but you lost your adoption, so adios. Um, just as we couldn't earn our way in, we also can't lose our way out. God loves us too much for that, so we are secure in this living room. We can bring whatever is going on, our highs, our lows, our mess-ups, our disasters, bring them all to God. I had this friend who was, um, he thought God was testing him. I don't know where this came from. God was always testing him. So um, I remember this one time he was having a financially rough time and, and they cut his pay at work. And he's like, I don't know what's going on. God must be testing me. Um, as if God was like a teacher just like sitting back to do an assessment test and sending it over. And I don't know if he thought that if he passed the test, he would get super rewarded. Or I never asked him what would happen if he failed this test. Um, but that doesn't sound much like a loving father. He's not waiting to test us or to toy with us. He simply loves us. And there are times we may not like his love. I don't know how many times I got grounded or was asked to do chores, and I swore it was because my parents hated me. I had other things to do that were much more fun. Um, but God loves us at the end of the day. We don't need to be afraid of that. So what do we do? We share everything that we have with him. We bring our, ourselves to him. And then we recognize that we have one who is with us, who is perfect, who wants us to thrive. His tremendous love is much, much deeper. Um, and he wants to be with us. I try and guide my niece. It's not working sometimes. She doesn't want to hear an 18-year-old girl apparently has some things figured out. Um, and I, at 18, was pretty sure that I did not stiff arm to my parents, too, and was like, no, I've got this, I don't need you. Um, but this is my first experience being on the other side of it, going, man, I have something so good for her, I wish she would take it in. Maybe that's how God is with us. So this year, let's take God in. Let's take up this offer of being an adopted child in his family and make the most of it. Spend time in the living room. Get curious about who God is. Spend time with him and go, God, how do you see stuff? What can you teach me? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? Because I want to be a part of this family. I want to represent this family well. We're deeply, deeply loved.